They were wounded, of course, by that last uh, um, election defeat, and they'll be doing their darndest to not repeat the same mistakes. But they find themselves in this really narrow path where wherever they step, either left or right, they're going to cause themselves some drama. And we look forward to that happening because, you know, there has to be a fair bit of skin taken off Albanese and taken off Labor between now and May for us to get the money. Good afternoon. Welcome to Sunday Sessions, live from the Facebook main page. My name is Andrew Kremen, and filling in for Rory O'Connor is James Peters. Welcome back. Thank you very much. It's great to be back once again. Good to have you here. It's good to have you. It's nearly election time. The Labor Party put forward a large wish list at the last election, but didn't manage to pull it off after a massive Liberal win. Today, we'll be looking at the dangers of a Labor government for this coming election, as well as their work with the Greens. Joining us is Mark Parton, Liberal Party member for Brenda Bella in the ACT, and Shadow Minister for Transport, Housing and Homelessness, Sustainable Building and Construction, and Gaming and Community Clubs. Quite the portfolio. Mark, welcome to Sunday Sessions. G'day. I feel like I've uh, let the team down on the wardrobe front, but um, never mind. <laughs> Here I am. No, no, that's that's right. You've you've got the you've got the smarts. You've got the portfolio. Um, we just we just look good. Um, as always, you can post your questions to Mark down in the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Beautiful. Uh, so firstly, tell us your concerns regarding a Labor Greens government winning the le- winning the next election. Look, uh, I think the, the point that you make is, is a Labor Greens government. And that's our biggest concern is that, I mean, obviously, we don't want um, Albanese as prime minister. But we certainly don't want a situation where where Labor are governing in some sort of power sharing agreement with the Greens, because, you know, we certainly see firsthand here in the ACT the the crazy outcomes that can arise from that. And I think, if, if anything, the biggest concern here is that the Greens have made it abundantly clear that um, they want to slash the defence budget in half. They want to cut it in half. And so... You know, even if when they sit around the table trying to flesh out some power sharing agreement, even if they don't arrive at a cut of 50 percent, you can guarantee that there will be a massive cut in defence. And I don't know if you've noticed what's going on in Ukraine or what's going on in China, but, you know, now is, is not the time to be messing with our national security. And the Greens, of course, they just believe that oh you can just sit down and you can just sit down and talk to the Taliban. You know, you can just sit down and talk to Vladimir Putin. And it's it's all about peace, not war. And we understand that obviously um, these uh, tensions and conflicts would always be better sorted out without uh, a, a a military option engaged. But sometimes, sometimes it's not possible to do otherwise. And I can tell you there is nobody walking around the streets of Mariupol or, or, or Kiev at the moment saying, geez, I wish we'd voted green here because we could have halved that defence budget and we don't need all these tanks. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a major, major concern. Have, have they actually committed to that in spite of the invasion of Ukraine? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been kind of about $300 billion. Yep. Look, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, of course, that message really cuts through in a jurisdiction like Canberra because we are such a defence town. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about the loss of thousands of jobs in the ACT. Uh, and, you know, it's very, very easy for Senator Zed Seselja to push forward with those sort of lines here because they resonate. And, you know, the reality is that so many of the um, the uh, uh, Labor Labor left and Greens voters here in the ACT are very well off public servants. You know, they're they're highly educated, affluent people who live in big houses, who, you know, have holiday homes and boats and drive BMWs. And it's a case of talking to those people about the, you know, the genuine reality of of voting in that ideological way. Because if you if you do that in the ACT and 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 they end up having um, you know, the, the Greens end up having the whip handle in terms of, of a possible power sharing agreement with the with the Labor Party. It could just be disastrous, disastrous. 
Now, Mark, I know it's a little bit hard, this question from you being in the ACT, but still when there's a swing, there is a swing. So what do you sense is, you know, what, you know, what do you sense is the direction in your electorate and the area? Do you feel that they're swinging more towards Liberal or Labor? Where do you feel that the country is going in general for this election? Look, I think it's I think it's really difficult to answer that question from any one part of Australia, because I know that in the you know, I've spoken to my former parliamentary colleague, Andrew Wall, who's moved up to North Queensland, and he tells me a completely different story to what's going on on the ground here. If Twitter was a city, it would be Canberra. OK, and so, look, sometimes it's it's disheartening to try and read the mood here in the ACT because it is a very progressive town. Um, and, and I guess, I guess that, um, that narrative isn't assisted by the fact that my good friend, Senator Seselja does sit very much to the right of the party. Um, so the mood on the ground here isn't flash, but it never is, you know, it never is. And I can certainly tell you, in, um, I, I uh, was a booth captain at a booth here in the southern suburbs of Canberra in 2019, and I was absolutely convinced that we had been smashed. You know, I can tell you that when I left, I, I did the, um, um, the scrutineering job at the booth, and I actually followed the rules. I didn't look at my phone, so I didn't see any of the outcomes as they were coming in in that first hour and a half. I think the first message I read as I was walking out the door, it said, Abbott's gone. And I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be a disaster. And we weren't even going to go to the party. We, I, I didn't even listen to results. I went home and made dinner and the TV was on in another room. And I heard Barnaby Joyce in the distance say, get up. He said a message to get up. Um, you don't know how to, how to win elections, do you? You know, if, if you'd done more than just target two seats, you could have won this, but you don't know how to do it. And I said to my wife, what did Barnaby just say then? What did he just say? And so we went into the TV to have a look. And, of course, you can never tell because I've got seats decided and, and, you know, seats in doubt. So the first thing I did was I got on my phone and I went to Sportsbet and it had the coalition $1.01. And I said to my wife, we're going to the party. We're going to the Southern Cross Club. <laughs> so, so I guess what I'm saying is my belief at 2019 was that we were dead in the water. Um, it's, it's not a good place to try and get a gauge of the federal mood here in Canberra. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, that's all right. I think it's a, I think it's a fairly accurate one, especially given the last election. Um, uh, now, what do you think of Anthony Albanese as a potential prime minister? Look, I mean, I've only met Albo twice. Seems like a nice fella. He's not the most inspirational character, is he? You know, he's um, he's. I think he's going to be found wanting if he finds himself at the lodge on a on a, a number of levels. And and I think we saw that more than ever before with the um, the aged care package that he unveiled in the budget reply. Because when he did roll it out, you know, it it, it sounded pretty solid. But it didn't take long for you to actually talk to people in that sector to get an understanding that Albanese or indeed whoever was putting his stuff together did not really have an understanding, a full and deep understanding of how that sector operates. Because many of the things that he promised, it's not going to be practical to roll them out. Um, so, you know, I think he's a, he's a, a tactician from way back. I think he's... Um, had a very tough job to hide his his uh, the left side of his body for the last uh, you know for the last two years because he's certainly pretending to everybody that that you know he's a, an economic rationalist and that um, and that it's not going to be like like Gough Whitlam but at the end of the day he's very much a left leaning Labor um, person and and you know we are going to see some disastrous tax policies and some disastrous decisions that will not benefit the country. And the country, you know, which has gone through the most amazing period, obviously the rest of the world's gone through it too, but to sit there as I did at Parliament House last week, and uh, this week, in fact, sorry, and, and to listen to our Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, go through and detail, um, you know, all of the decisions that were made and, and how indeed we have as a nation tracked through this crisis and done so 
in in such a better way than most of the OECD countries, I think is is amazing. And I just hope that that narrative can pervade some of this other um, rubbish that's coming from the left. Because wow, guys, there's some rubbish out there at the moment, isn't there? Um, you know, it's 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 crazy. And I, I think it's one of the one of the great problems that we have on the right is that the left are much better at creating the narrative through. Um, third party operatives, you know, through get up and through all sorts of people. You know, there's all sorts of of highly skilled individuals that are that are rolling out content on social media channels um, that is detrimental to our cause. And it's something that as a as a as a political party, um, you know, and I talk about the liberals, but I think we've got to include the nationals as well. We've really got to think hard about how we can change that narrative and how we can blunt those attacks because because more and more in the digital age that's where hearts and minds will be won and lost this whole thing that he's a fiscal conservative and it just sort of strikes me back to the um kevin 07 campaign where kevin came out and his whole thing was not to be the person going against howard but to be the successor of howard the the generation change and he was a fiscal conservative, and that was the whole message. And the next, the other thing which we've seen is now that the ALP has actually hired the same campaign director for the Kevin 07 campaign to do the same thing now, and they're doing Albo 22. Do you think that they're trying to make Albo into the same sort of Kevin Rudd era sort of politician? Big time, big time. And, you know, obviously there's been a hell of a lot of work done on on changing his image. And by and large, it's been quite successful. Um, you know, and, and, you know, let's make no bones about it. There is a large cohort of Australians for which the Prime Minister is on the nose. You know, that's, that's one of the difficult things that we face here. Now, I think that's going to happen more and more as we progress through this century in that, Whoever is in power, particularly if they're on the conservative side, there will be forces that are marshaled against them. And this, you know, this massive character assassination scenario that unfolds in all forms of, of, of digital media. And uh, but it's, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't it makes it really, really tough for us. It's certainly doable. And um, James, I was saying to you before we started the, um, the live that I've won a hell of a lot of money. Um, betting on elections in the past. Last week, or this, the week just gone, <clears throat> I backed the coalition. Um, I took the $3, you know, I thought, yeah, I, I think that was a pretty solid budget. And, uh, and I think we're in this up to our ears. If I, if I can follow up um, something you mentioned before regard, uh, regarding no fearing, if you've got a Labor Greens government and they're, and they're deciding to cut the military budget, um, we previously spoke with Malcolm Davies of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, he actually picked when Putin would invade Ukraine. Really? Um, and, he's, and, he's, uh, and he's arguing that um, China may target Taiwan in 2025. Um, you know, there's the potential, if Anthony Albanese becomes prime minister, to become a wartime prime minister. Um, you know, do you see him in that position? Uh, look, again, I just think it would be disastrous. Um, and and I, you know, I remain hopeful that the country, the rest of the country, will be able to see that that is going to be a massive problem. And you know, don't underestimate what's going on in the Solomon Islands because that's extremely significant for us, and it means that the Chinese will be so much closer to our doorstep. And it's not the time to be messing with national security. It's just not. Um, and, and again, as we know, Labor may end up having to deal with the Greens. And if they do, you know, so many things like that are going to be, are going to be difficult. I, I, think, I think in the Greens' utopian world, they wouldn't even have a defence minister. They'd just have a minister for peace. It'd be Jordan Steele John, and he could just march over to China and just talk to them and everything would be fine. They just live in, in fairyland. They live in fairyland. Just, just like social, I'm a bit of a dream. Um, but talking on that, and especially sort of the background groups of um, and beliefs of the Labor Party, on page four of the ALP constitution, it lists that the ALP as a democratic socialist party. Now, I'm not sure your average voter is aware of this. Much of the West seems to be moving in that direction as well. 
What might it mean for Australia's views if they're given the power to the, pursue these goals, especially just like we've mentioned before, if the Greens also have part of the power? Look, I think socialism as a word doesn't frighten people as much as it did, you know, 20 years ago. And, um, and you know, there is, of course, a large cohort of people who, um, who believe that socialism is the way. And it's, it's, it's a problem. And it's certainly a problem for um, as we try to win the hearts and minds of voters who are under the age of, of 30. Um, because, I don't know, the way that um, uh, education is rolled out these days and the way that those third party groups on the left communicate to, to people in that cohort makes it very, very difficult for us to, to win their hearts and minds. And I was trying to explain to someone on a TikTok Live the other day why we typically see people in Australia, not all the time, but typically we see them drift from left to right politically as they get older. And I explained it to them by saying, look, if you're 17 years old and you have no possessions, um, and it's not to say that you're not working hard because you might be studying, you might be working a, a part-time job, but if you don't own anything, the concept of getting all of the wealth in the country, putting it all in one spot and then divvying it up and, and giving it to everyone evenly sounds like a cracker of an idea. It's not until you actually begin to acquire wealth that all of a sudden the sheen comes off it. Um, and so uh, that combined with the fact that when we're, 17 and 18 and 20 and 25. And again, I know I've got a number of young people watching this and I'm not meaning for this to be disparaging, but it's just the way that it is that at that age, you think you know how the world works. And often as you navigate your way through life, you sort of see that it doesn't work quite the way that you thought it did. And so, you know, we do see this, this drift from left to right. I guess what, what we've got to do, and when I say we, I mean, you know, all of us together that are talking, not just in this election, but, but, but in all of them, is to try and get more people in that cohort to see the light. Just following up from that, I mean, even at universities, I, like we've spoken, I am the president of Macquarie, uh, Macquarie University Liberal Club, and most recently we had a debate with the Macquarie University Socialist on socialism versus capitalism. And one of the, the best, one of the number one things which the socialists and as well the Greens always bring up when they talk about the division of wealth um, is that it's always the bosses which have that wealth and the employees are the ones which are trapped within this wage slavery. And as someone who now runs their own business, it's trying to convey to people, and it's a really hard message to do, that it is a huge risk that you bear on your shoulders when you employ someone. So do you see that we're going to have to continue having these fights with young people or is it just a way of the education system or what's the matter? Look, you ask a really good question because you know that those people that you are arguing with, for some of them, it doesn't matter what you say, they will never see your position because they have this belief that anyone who is employing someone is an evil rich bastard and that anyone who is employing someone is making a bucket load of cash and and that and that you know we as a country need to get more money from them and we've seen you know so many examples in history and i guess the best of them comes up from the uk where um you know tax rates were pushed to a certain level that that people who were um, you know, employing people and people who were making decisions that would bring money into the economy just said, nah, I can't do this here anymore. I've got to go. I've got to go. Um, I've got to leave and go somewhere else where I can actually do it. Because if you remove the um, incentive for people, well, they're not going to take the risk. You know, they're just not going to take the risk. And we see that play out in so many ways. And and I'll tell you one of the other areas where that, those arguments play out is this ridiculous argument that goes on at the moment about, um, about landlords and renting and this perception that every landlord is an evil bastard who's just trying to suck money out of, out of renters. And so many of the people participating in this discussion from the far left believe that if all landlords left the market tomorrow, that everything would be fine and hunky-dory because all of those renters 
would buy the properties. Now, we all know that there's a bunch of people renting in this country who are never going to own a home, partly because they don't ever want to, partly because they don't have the means. And so unless you have a functioning private rental market, well, those people are going to be homeless. And unless there are incentives for people to invest in rental properties, well, then they're not going to, they're not going to invest in them. So, you know, it's just an absurd utopian argument from people who just have no idea how the world works. Last election, Labor, expected to win, were rather open with many of their plans that would otherwise be unpopular. Do you think they will try them again if they win the next election? So, sorry, I missed a part of that question. The, oh. the, which plans were you talking about? Um, so, well, well, f- well, for example, uh, they have... For example, abortion is one is a key um, is a key concern of theirs. They were hoping to make that free under the public system. Um, you know that was you know that was something that was promised, and of course they ended up losing that election. Do you think things along those grounds they will try them again if they win the next election? I don't know. Like like I get the sense that that uh, among their biggest mistakes in that last election was you know that whole franking credits debate and the 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 push for them to remove um, tax incentives, particularly from older Australians, and that they thought they could, they could just sort of announce those and 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 push them through. It's going to be fascinating to see what actual detail, because we all know that we haven't seen much detail from Labor in this space, and I think they'll be trying to skate through so many of the policy debates without laying much detail on the line. Um, look. You know, they were wounded, of course, by that last uh, um, election defeat, and they'll be doing their darndest to not repeat the same mistakes. But they find themselves in this really narrow path where wherever they step, either left or right, they're going to cause themselves some drama. And we look forward to that happening because, you know, there has to be a fair bit of skin taken off Albanese and taken off Labor between now and May for us to get the money. Mm. We've got, uh, there's an audience question here um, on the issue of home ownership. How does a liberal approach affo- to affordable housing this election better than a labour approach? This is definitely one of the key issues for young people. Look, it is. And I've got to say, I, um, you know, I'm a, a member of the ACT Legislative Assembly. Um, there's not a great deal of the detail on that federal policy that I'm across. Um, so... I think I'm going to struggle to answer that question. Um, So much of our housing affordability discussion here is about land release in the ACT, which is all determined by by the ACT government. But in terms of what the feds have laid out, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't have a deep enough understanding of that policy space to answer. So my apologies to that, to that uh, viewer. That's all right. Um, What's going on with the land release? In the ACT? So this is the only jurisdiction in Australia where the government has complete control of land release. They decide how much land to release, when to release it, they put the price on it. Um, And so this should be the place where the government has the ability to, to have an impact on housing affordability. What they've done though over a period of a decade is they've strangled the supply of land, particularly for detached housing, because they want everybody living in apartments, you see, because that's what utopia looks like. They released a planning vision here, which suggested that from now until the end of time, 70% of all dwellings must be urban infill um, because, you see, we've run out of land. Now, I don't know how many times people watching this have driven around Canberra in the last, uh, in the last few years, but we definitely haven't run out of land. And so that, that um, land release policy has dramatically increased the price of those blocks. Now, when I say the government... Um, chooses the price, they release a lot of that land in land ballots where people basically go into a lottery and their number is drawn out, giving them the ability to purchase the block at the government uh, um, uh, signified price. The last ballot we had, there were 71 blocks, 12,000 people entered, 12,000 for 71 blocks. So you can see that demand is far outstripping supply, and that's one of the biggest drivers of housing unaffordability here in the ACT. And of course, what what we see here is that if the market is demanding standalone blocks, 
but the government's not providing them, well, then people will just march over the border because they can do that in the ACT and they purchase standalone housing in Gugong, in Murrumbateman, in Bungendore, just in the surrounding areas of, of New South Wales. And those people, of course, we lose A, their um, land sale price because it goes to New South Wales. We lose their rates, um, but we're still by and large providing services for them because most of them are living and working here in the ACT. And it also blows away that whole idea that, um, you know, we're, we're building up because it's environmentally friendly for us to, to build all these apartments because we can be this cool, compact city. Because, guys, if people are just buying 20 kilometres that way and 30 kilometres that way, well, then we're actually expanding the footprint, even though it's not within the ACT. So those arguments completely go out the window. So I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but I'm a bit passionate about it because I am just making a mess of it. And just in closing on that, can I say, the biggest voice in the media about this who comes out with a big baseball bat and smacks the Chief Minister once a month is John Stanhope, who's the former Labor Chief Minister here who is absolutely ropeable at the path that this government has gone down. And, um, yeah, we use him a lot, which is just bizarre because, you know, he was a Labor chief minister for 10 years, but all of a sudden in this space, he's trumpeting our tune. Just to continue on that one there, especially with housing, and I think going a little bit further on the question that we had from the audience, I man, housing affordability is a big thing, especially us being here in Sydney, like we were talking before, I'm from the Hunter um, and we tend to find that there's becoming this rhetoric that the uh, that developers are the bad people, that developers are the reason why housing um, is becoming so expensive. Do you think there's a way that we can change the message that we actually need more sustainable development to have lower housing prices? Look, I think we do need to have more sustainable development to have long housing prices. I'm a big fan of, uh, of our Prime Minister, massive fan of Morrison. But I didn't think his comments in the last week were helpful when he suggested in response to a journalist in a media interview that it was asking him about rent relief and he, was, he said, oh, well, the answer is for these people to buy homes. Yeah, no, I don't think that's the response to give. I can't tell you what the correct response was, but I don't think that's it. Um, and um, look, housing affordability is a major problem. And certainly the government are well and truly aware of the fact that cost of living is a, is a major concern. And that's why so many of the measures that were rolled out last week were rolled out. Uh, and, you know, I, I think those measures will have an effect. And, you know, they, sure, there's an election coming up. And there are, you can't get away from the fact that there are some budgetary decisions that are made with a view of the electoral calendar. But additionally, those measures that have been implemented were required. You know, they were definitely required. So, um, you know, I, I think it was a good package rolled out by Frydenberg. And I, I, I guess I wish that there had been more in the, in the housing affordability space. But, you know, the beauty of this budget too was that, um, it was measured, you know, we are set to be in the red for a long, long time and we don't want it to be any longer than it, than it, than it possibly should be. And so there's a bunch of things, a bunch of additional things that we could have spent money on um, and, and perhaps should have spent more money on, but you can't spend money on everything. To just continue on, we've, we've spoken a bit also about um, the Greens and especially some of the dangerous things that they are wanting to do and most recently the greens have come out saying that they will cancel all student debt if they hold the balance of power at the next election obviously this is appealing to many but why should we as young people and as liberals and conservatives be opposing this move it's a really interesting one isn't it i mean i guess it just gets down to the the greens have this concept that um money is free and that the government has endless supplies of it um and you know at the end of the day, also, it's it's done. That particular policy is done to shore up those votes in those um, in those younger age groups. What we see unfold in the ACT, in every other jurisdiction apart from Canberra, the Greens can come out and make outlandish promises and promise you know all sorts of things, knowing full well that they will never ever be a part of government, and so they'll never have to deliver them. Here in the ACT, we've seen that that. 
they are a part of the government. You know, they've got three ministers uh, in, in the cabinet here. And we are staring down the barrel at the possibility of them having a, a, a bigger say in, in um, the, the federal government, should it be Albanese. So I think we have reached a time in our political life that we can't, the, the country can't just dismiss these Greens ideas as the ravings of a, of a left-wing fringe group. Yes, they are a left-wing extremist group, but all of a sudden there is the real possibility that they could get get at least a finger on uh, on on you know the wheels of power and and perhaps um, you know un, un, unleash some of these ridiculous policies. I mean, last week here, one of our Greens MLAs put out a discussion paper advocating that we go down the path of having car-free days this year in 2022. Um, Car-free days in a city that spans, what, like 35, 40 kilometres um, with a public transport system, which is rubbish. Uh, and, you know, I, my wife is from Bogota, Colombia, where they do have one car-free day every year. And so I know very well how it works over there. And if you, drive, if you dare to drive your petrol-powered car, you get fined savagely. Now, who's on, on what planet... Is that going to achieve anything other than massive virtue signalling and making people's lives hell? You know, it's 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 rubbish. Uh, what power do the Greens wield in the ACT? Have they stayed their course as an environmental party, or as has been alluded here, are they going for a woke agenda? What do you see the Greens doing at the next federal election? Yeah, look, I, I think people should be having a close look at what's happened in the ACT and. Um, if do yourself a favour and search for Labor Greens power sharing agreement, Canberra, and you will see this massive document that um, is, you know, is a public document and, and it details um, what must be done to keep everybody happy in this, uh, in this coalition. We call it here the CLAG because we get sick of people referring to the LNP and and we we had to say you know the 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 coalition of labor and the greens the labor greens power sharing agreement so we went with coalition of labor and greens CLAG and we call it the CLAG and they've outlined a stack of things but it's it's across most portfolios it's not just environmental a lot of it links back to environment and there's a little bit of drama going on at the moment over a draft variation which has been pushed through to our planning laws here which dramatically changes how much you can use of your brand new housing block to build a house. And um, I can tell you that those 71 lucky people that were able to purchase their blocks in that ballot that we mentioned earlier, they were selected out of the barrel and there were 12,000 in the pool, 70 of them have won their block. When these new planning laws come into force on July 1, most of those people will not be able to build the house that they had designed on that block because the Greens have forced this change to plot ratio and it's the micro blocks that are being sold now here in the ACT, it will become almost impossible for you to build a three-bedroom house on it without making it double storey. And what does that, uh, what does that strike at? Housing affordability, ladies and gentlemen, housing affordability. Because the reality is saving the planet's a great thing, but it's going to cost money. It's going to cost somebody money. And in these instances, it's going to cost these young first home buyers, many of whom will not have the, the economic um, uh, ability to, to, to build a two-storey house. So a lot of them will just have to give the block back if the rules don't change. To go further into the Labor Greens coalition, especially within your experience in the ACT Assembly, yeah. why have there not been a Liberal government in Canberra in the last 20 years? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. Um, and, you know, we went desperately close on a number of occasions. It is very much a, a left-leaning jurisdiction. Now, look, I'm sure... Um, in the lead up to Mark McGowan's stunning victory in, uh, in Western Australia. Um, I'm sure there would have been some Labor people who would have said for a period of time, it's very much a conservative electorate. So to some extent, you've got to throw these things out the window, but it is a progressive electorate. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Washington, D.C., but I can tell you in Washington, D.C., 
which, you know, is one of the cities in the States that you could compare Canberra to, the Republicans are never winning. <laughs> They're never winning because it's just not that sort of city. We can win in Canberra and we will. Um, look, we ultimately, and, and this is going to sound self-defeating to some extent, we're unlikely to win power here unless there's a Labor government federally, if you look at history. You know, it, it, it just goes that people, voters at the ballot box often find it difficult to separate um, territory politics from federal politics. And it is much easier for us to win if there's an unpopular Labor government. Now, let me tell you, we'll be campaigning for Zed as hard as we possibly can. And in 2024, um, Elizabeth Lee and her team, including me, will be powering ahead in the belief that we can change things. We've got four seats that we've got to win to win government, and we believe that we can do it. It's just a case of laying out some... Um, some policies on the on the uh, on the line that that are going to convince most of Canberra that uh, that we can govern better than them. We just have a um, comment here in the live chat, and yep. the first one is saying that the Labor Greens are so dangerous because they are usually unaccountable for their decisions. And then, secondly, talking about why the ACT is such a hard electorate, being because it's full of the public servants who vote. Do you have anything to further to add on to that? Yeah, look, the public servant argument is absolutely on the money and you can guarantee that, um, you know, Labor and the Greens here will roll out argument after argument suggesting that we're going to cut the public service. Now, in that last election, we made it abundantly clear that we were not cutting a single number from public service and that indeed, based on things that we were doing regarding putting more frontline workers in, we'd probably be increasing the public service. But when you've got... Um, nurses and firefighters and teachers, you know, going door to door, knocking on doors and saying those evil liberals are going are gonna to sack us. It's, you know, it's tough to battle that sort of narrative. The unions do make a big difference on the ground here. They make a really big difference. And I'm sorry, the first one about them being unaccountable for, for their decisions. Well, see, that normally applies, but it doesn't apply here. They are accountable for their decisions here. And I'm the housing shadow here. The Greens went to the election in 2020 promising a home for everybody. They're going to give a home to everyone. Everyone that wants one. Um, the woman who is now the Minister for Housing and Homelessness Services, she is on a video prior to the election saying, ah, oh, hi, at the Greens, we're going to give a home to everyone because everyone should have a home. And now I've asked her in question time on a number of occasions, when is, when is the delivery date of that home for everyone, you know, because we want to know exactly when all those people that want, they want to know when they're going to get it. Oh, she says it's an aspirational goal. And so they can be held accountable and they will, because we will get to the shadow of the election in 2024 and we will still have a housing crisis here and we'll still have a stack of people that are homeless and we will hold them to account because it's like, guys, this is not utopia and it's no closer to utopia now than it was when you took over. So here is one of the places where we can and will hold them to account. Perhaps you're uh, preaching to the converted, but why should we vote or why should an undecided vote the coalition for the coming election? Look, I think you've got to take it, you, you've got to take your hat off to Morrison and Frydenberg and so many of the other operatives within this government in the way that they have navigated their way through the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. You know, and Frydenberg, I was listening to his um, uh, National Press Club lunch. I was there. I was, I was right on the back wall. <laughs> like, it's a massive room, the, the Great Hall. And when I sat down and there was a bunch of accountants uh, who were on the table next to me and I said, guys... I don't think anyone's going to be getting any pictures of us because we're a long way from Frydenberg. One of the things he pointed out was that the global financial crisis saw the world economy contract 0.1%. Um, the COVID pandemic saw the global economy um, contract 3.1%. So we're talking 30 times more uh, of a contraction than the global financial crisis. And there were prophecies of doom all the way through on on um, mortality, on the collapse of the economy, on the collapse of home markets, none of that happened. So, you know, I, I think that, that this government should be given credence for, for guiding us through this pandemic in, in, in a way that's better than most other nations on the planet. And 
as we as we go into this time of uncertainty regarding uh, you know national security with with Russia on the move, with China potentially on the move, I just don't think it's the time to be handing the reins to ideologues um, who will definitely try to out progressive each other uh, because uh, because you know I'm I'm confident that we are in the best hands now that we could possibly be, and we just got to convince more Australians that that's the case. And just, just finally, one of the things that we find as Liberals and I mean coming more recently is that you tell someone, especially outside of the ACT, that Labor and the Greens are pretty much the same thing and they go on a whole rant and they tell, no, they're not, no, we're not. I mean, right here I have sitting on my phone a screenshot from Dr Michael Holland, MP, the new member for Bega, who during the by-election was sharing a post saying voting Greens won question mark vote to Labor. They consistently do a preference deal. They have a shared coalition in the ACT. So they are the same party, essentially, and they do work together. And it's not impossible to say that if it's a hung parliament, that they're not going to work together, despite what Albanese says, because he'll want the power if it does come. So what are the final dangers that you can say that we have to look out for if they do get elected together? Look, I think people should be pointing it perennially to the ACT, um, you know, and saying this this is what happens when Labor need the Greens to govern. It's quite possible that they're going to need that federally, and it's a disaster. <coughs> you know, it's an absolute disaster. And, James, you and I were talking about it earlier, that what you see is in that sort of scenario, you see the Greens and Labor trying to out-progressive each other. Who would have thought that a Labor government would ban greyhound racing anywhere? Because, you know, I know you know from, from, from where you're from, you know what a, what a grassroots workers' sport greyhound racing is. And certainly Dan Andrews is well aware of it in Victoria. There's no way on God's earth that they'd be moving down that path in Victoria. But the, the reason that they've arrived at that position is because they, they need to try and out-progressive the Greens because Labor here is always worried about losing votes to the left, about them seeping over to the Greens. So... You know, it's a, it's just, it's a massive problem, and God, I hope it never, it never unfolds federally. You know, I, I, I hope that that Greens vote continues to, you know, either stay where it is or fall, because God help us as a country if we see the Greens with more power than they have now. You know, I just think it would be disastrous. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's been absolutely fantastic. A little bit scary thinking about the potential of them getting in power, but also motivating to get out there and fight harder to ensure that we can get a coalition government re-elected at this federal election. Thank you very much. If people want to look out for you more and find out more of the work you can doing, they can follow you on Instagram and uh, follow your Facebook page, but more importantly, jump on his TikTok Fantastic to watch him on there, jump on the lives and he'll be there to chat to you. Thank you very much, Mark. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it too, mate. So good to be here. And uh, here's Gaffy. He's saying hello at the end as well. Um, you got to love a Kelpie. Beautiful. Cheers. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thank you.